Uh, am I audible? Brilliant. Yep. Starting in three, two, one. Dear panel, I think that there is a problem that the current international law simply isn't reflective of the status of the world that we live in, in which war isn't waged the same way as it was 200 years ago. I think that the interdependence of the world means that economic warfare or generally causing economic damage to other countries is something that is used significantly more and is something that is a way that is used to achieve political, social, colonial, or any other types of aims that countries might have. I think that international law needs to reflect the need of countries to retaliate towards that. I'll start with a few bits of uh, framing, secondly, on how this is going to change the types of ways in which you're able to have diplomacy or like generally interactions between countries and then thirdly why are going why like the economic understanding or like the way countries engage economically is something that means this is a justified form of warfare uh, how that occurs bits of framing firstly i think that the fact that something can can be justified under uh, under international law doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to be justified this is something this is what we mean by this is that we are not saying that it's always going to be like in any type of situation when one economic sanction is pushed onto you rather it's still needs to be things that it is proportional. I don't know, you're given notice when, you, when you're conducting that warfare, respecting civilian lives and respecting rest of the li uh, like rest of like rules of war. I think that that is something that is a reasonable thing to say. Secondly, I think it's very likely that this is something that is going to be used as a last resort. I think that generally going to war, especially if you're an economically torn country, is something that is economically harm, uh, like economically very harsh in a country and a decision you're unable to make easily. And secondly, war is obviously politically costly in terms of lives lost, in terms of the way you need to wage with it. And engage with your population. Thirdly, I think that at a, in, in, in cases where this is actually something that is going to be used, notice that it's very likely that a situation when you are economically so much harmed by another country, it is likely that you're already in a power imbalance situation with that country, meaning that presumably the country that would be in the victim role is probably one that already has less power. That means that whatever military power they would have is something that is probably not going to cause a mass scale of damage into the entire world, I think, oftentimes, or at least I think that that's the way it's going to be used or justified in a proportional sense. Lastly, I think that I'm not like it's unclear how where exactly this would be used in the world, but I think that this is something that is going to like, especially in the future, this is something that can be justified or used. And I think that this is what this debate is about. What is this then going to change and what this means? I think that this is something that is like this type of war is something that will probably happen on either side of the house. Notice that when a country is so significantly in an economic despair that they are unable to do anything else about it, and this is done by one very specific aggressor against them, I think it's very likely that they would do it anyways, even if international law prohibited it. I think it's crucial that then international law is the thing that recognizes that this is something that is justified. Why is this the case? I think that it does a couple of things. Firstly, it opens up other avenues of diplomacy, given that this is something that you know that is likely to happen, it's much more likely to be able to get the other party to the negotiating table if they previously were unwilling to do so at a point at which they knew that, ah, like going towards something that is illegitimate, it won't happen, or at least we can able, we're later able to say that that was something that was really harmful and like prosecute the other, st other state for it. Secondly, I think that the, the fact that they, like this, what this changes is the incentive of other actors or like third parties who are also to somewhat proximate to the conflict in that sense. I think at, at a point at which you know that this is something that is a legitimate action to take, you're much more likely to support Support this victim state, especially given in a situation that most countries, especially especially when you're proximate to those countries existing, then you're also not interested in having like all-out war happening there. I think at that point you're much more likely to extend support, extend help to those countries. I think what this means is that the fact that you can have recognition to these conflicts happening or the possibility of them happening means that you're actually able to help the population. If this war happens on either side of the house and international law simply condemns it, the people in those countries suffering from those economic conditions are never going to be able to get better. And no one is going to extend any type of help to them. So I think that it is significantly better that you're able to have, like, incentivize other actors to go in and also support them and get some type of benefit for this. Why is this something that is justified in terms of like economically? Why is that enough of a reasoning to go into war? I think that firstly, capitalism means that you generally need to like overall in the world to make like maintain or like exist as a country. You need to negotiate and engage with other countries in order to access things like resources. Given that resources are something that are arbitrarily and in unequally distributed within the entire world, that is something that is that is something that you are unable to choose and meaningfully decide on how you want to do. But you're fundamentally always dependent on some other countries that you need. 
to engage in a specific way. But for example, look at things like, I don't know, gas, access to water, access to minerals or resources, all of those things that meaningfully alter the way you're able to exist within your population. You need those types of resources, one, to fundamentally live when we're talking about things like water, but two, also to, like, I don't know, develop technologies, like have an industry, maintain yourself as a country on its own. So these things are something that are fundamentally crucial to your existence as a country. So I think that at that point already, it shows that economics is something that is meaningful and it's something that you're unable to control in other ways. I think that at the point at which like your economic the economic damage that another country is able to cause to you is so so significant that you're willing to like willing to go to work it has many like severe impacts that show that this is equal to other situations in which we think that war is justified i .e., look at the fact that if your state economy is something that is so significantly harmed that you're unable to do anything any type of things like i don't know welfare or provide access to basic water and food and basic health care to the average person then that is something that is already killing people within your like within your state and i think that the harms of that are similar to that of any type of like actual war happening which oftentimes is also constrained in a very specific region and i'm unsure why that would affect the entire population in a similar situation so i think that those situations are equal before i talk about the second reason i would happily take closing yeah so are you more likely to get aid when people are feeling sorry saving people from the repressor or when they are accused of funding a war I think that you're more likely to get funding at a point at which people one want to avoid the, like a, a war happening, but two also when you see that the the economic situation of that country is already dire. I think that at the point at which you're unwilling to give aid to a country because you think that like that war is like I don't know illegitimate or you support the aggressor, there is no change in those types of situations because you're already siding with the aggressor country. I think that there's no change there. I think that the second reason why economic uh, like why economic warfare is something that justifies going to war is that economic access generally to economics and like uh, access. To so I don't know, resources, access to welfare, access to market economics is something that is fundamental to people's agency, given that we do live in a capitalist society. This is the way, this is the thing that gives you access and an ability to uh, to like meet any of your preferences that you might have and make choices within, within your country. So even if no one is dying, I think that the fact that your country is so, so poor that you're barely managing is something that is taking away your agency. I think at that point, what this creates is it's essentially like a self-defense for those types of countries, given that this is something that has so significantly stopped the, these countries uh, like ability to uh, like uh, the people in those countries their ability to i don't know self-actualize or access any type of meaningful choice the compare it doesn't have to be that those people would have to live in riches but i think that even at the point at which like any type of harm is caused that is a bad thing i think that what this would then do is that other countries are significantly more likely to use sanctions in a way that isn't going to penalize the entire population they aren't going to si simply cause harm for the act of causing harm because they know that there might be some retaliation to it i think that this is something that is justified and necessary necessary in today's capitalist society. Vote OG. Thank you for that fine speech, Prime Minister. May we now have the Leader of Opposition to present a case for the open Thank you, Prime Minister. And for POIs, please type it. I'm going to be talking about three things in this speech. Firstly, why military retaliation is never justified. Secondly, why if war is fought under either side of the house, it is worse in government's world. And finally, about global power imbalances. On to the first thing about why military retaliation is never justified. The first reason for this is that this is a fundamental misallocation of moral responsibility. Even if an actor does something that is bad economically for another state, like they massively sanction them, even when, when that is a bad thing, that was the choice of a political leader. That being said, the people who are harmed by violence are disproportionately innocent civilians who cannot afford mansions, who cannot afford bodyguards, who cannot afford to move to another state, whose houses are bombed and whose infrastructure is destroyed. I think the reason why this is wrong is that it inherently involves a basic level of instrumentalization, even if a gov team can prove like deterrence or some other kind of positive outcome. I think that given that innocent civilians have not consented to use their bodies in order to improve the lives of future civilians, it is wrong to instrumentalize, it is wrong to instrumentalize them in that capacity. I think that as an intuition, Tuition pump here, we probably would not torture like an entire school of children if we were unsure whose child, like a like if one kid was the child of a terrorist to try and stop an attack, because individuals have unique claims to their rights that are, that are not morally hung on the rights claims of other people. The second thing to say here is that forms of military retaliation are almost never going to be proportional at the end of the day. Yes, it is true that economic retaliation can have harms, but the unique thing about war is that it has economic consequences and it has extreme consequences to human rights. You replicate the economic harms when infrastructure is just destroyed and millions of people leave their jobs, but you also get the harms of like individuals dying when they when they're exposed to chemical warfare. 
You also get the emotional harms of individuals living every single day of their lives in fear, meaning that those harms are often a lot higher. I think that crucially, war is often something that is uncontrollable. So even if states have good incentives and they abide by international law initially, which is not going to happen due to the subjectivity of criteria that's described in PM, you cannot control how that war is going to evolve after it ends up happening, where you often end up getting things like new proxy actors who try and profiteer from a conflict, et cetera, et cetera. What then are the conclusions of this? Firstly, I think that principally, insofar as international law has a moral signaling effect, you should never include something that inherently involves instrumentalization and unjust outcomes. Secondly, I just disagree with PM that this is not going to normalize war and, and increase its likelihood. I actually do think that they're going to probably increase the probability of war happening in some cases. And the reason for this is war taking place operates on the basis of a variety of global norms. When waging war appears to violate a global norm, that implicitly increases the cost of what that war are going to be. You're more likely you're more likely to get things like like economic sanctions being levied on your state that can harm other forms of interest. You're more likely to, to get things like alienation from regional trade blocks and international organizations that are often important for the soft power of your own country. You're more likely to like to be like prosecuted in international courts and receive retaliation after the fact when it appears to be a grave moral wrong, especially over a period of like decades in a period of years. What this means then is that you're likely to prevent war being only utilized as as, as a weapon of last resort, and it's more likely to be used as a first resort thing. Um, the PM basically says, but you can like, you like bring countries to, to the negotiating table. Not only is this a concession that there are other options that exist under the status quo for forms of recourse, that's less likely to happen when this is not viewed as what we are supposed to do, i.e. the US and China are supposed to engage in diplomatic negotiations to, to resolve the trade war when you normalize forms of like military conflict as being a first negotiation. I think the only way that God can then beat this is be like, well, what about future victims when it comes to forms of deterrence? It's never going to exist for two reasons. Firstly, there's always going to be uncertainty over, over whether another state is going to retaliate in the first place like militarily. In some cases, I do think this is going to tip them in favor of going to war. And I'm going to weigh why that's, why, why that's really harmful, but it's unclear. And secondly, and relatedly, there's often very, very compelling reasons to commit a variety of economic harms to other states. There's often a political benefit where as soon as being a bad leader, if another state does something against you, but you do not retaliate economically, it's, it's also often beneficial for your own economy as well. So for example, like a huge imposition of tariffs can be beneficial for domestic industries, blah, blah, blah. Even if a prop team gets deterrence in some cases, those are vastly outweighed by even one more conflict under our side of the house. We have literally get a civil war where like tens of thousands of people die, you get huge RAS refugee like inflows into, into a variety of states, and there's so many kinds of harmful outcomes at the end of the day. Second main contribution, when military retaliation would happen under either side of the house, it is done in far worse ways. I think we can win on the way of one more war happening, but I also do agree that in some cases it's probably going to be symmetric or due to the high cost of like economic harms, countries are going to fight war under either side of the house. Here are three reasons why enshrining an international law is going to lead to worse outcomes. The first thing to say is that countries are going to commit more abuses because they think that the future cost of punishment are going to be lower. There's a different moral standard for what a state's allowed to do when something is enshrined in like international war law, which is like the Geneva Conventions and just criminal law that exists in the vast majority of states. What, what this then means is that you can get away with doing a lot more bad things like killing people in war that are legitimate, that are not legitimate in other things. And therefore both ordinary soldiers think they're going to be less pro it's likely to be prosecuted in military courts as well as well as higher up officials. Secondly, it's less likely to be forms of domestic and international scrutiny over the ways that wars are being fought. This is because the country is fighting war appears to be a lot more moralistic to the global norms analysis that I that I said earlier, where they can literally say what we were doing is legal because it's something that was enshrined in doctrine in the first place. What this looks like in the real world are like fewer preemptive sanctions to try and stop this in the first place it means that the state's going to be better resourced to, to be able to fight overall. Less domestic, po like political and international scrutiny where there's likely to be forms of retaliation if, if you commit the worst kinds of abuses. Like these really populist holding the belief system or a portion of, the, of these really populist like believes that some of the things that are being done are okay and that's justified on the, on the basis of like the, the the other side of the conflict was so bad because you don't have the form of like domestic international scrutiny. Um, and just that when you're less likely to experience forms of alienation that emboldens you a lot within the conflict. I think that finally we can just use Jason's POI under the same mechanism of being likely to get forms of aid and humanitarian help and you can get an increased sympathization of the victim rather the rather than the oppressor, but you can have a more black and white narrative over how this works. Before I continue, I'll, I'll take closing. Who is it that you think is actually enforcing international law? Is there some global policeman going around and making us follow those laws? I think that no, and I think that that's why it's probably a bad thing um, if this happens, because due to a high level of subjectivity, they just allow states to optically exploit this and to fight more wars, even if they're not actually following all the mechanisms of proportionality that we hear in PM. I think that's something that PM says that kind of responds to this is like, but it's good if more if you now help smaller states more in war. I think that this is a bad thing, right? Like, even if for some strategic reasons, you're going to help a victim in the conflict, which I'm unsure whether it's ever going to happen. That's bad because you end up just prolonging the war when each side is better well resourced and you get a situation like Yemen, where there's backers from both sides 
tried that ended up happening for extended periods of time. Finally, on global power imbalances, this is never going to be smaller states using this to help themselves, but it's always going to be larger states weaponizing this against smaller states. The reason for this is if there is economic coercion from a larger actor, if you respond militarily as a smaller state, it's likely to be to result in a tit for tat military response where you're always going to be outcompeted on a military level when other states have larger militaries that, that than you. Therefore, larger states are only going to are exclusively going to have the capacity to try and invest militarily to like a larger extent when they know that that's not going to result in like a net harmful outcome for their state. The, the impact of this is that smaller states lose a large degree of economic leverage when there's always implicit risk that retaliating against another state is going to result in a higher likelihood of military intervention. I think that, that the reason that, that this is bad is that status quo things like trade negotiations, you might be able to do things like spread enough cutting like exports of natural resources, like forms of cobalt that are going to other states that are really important, which is actually positive because it means that smaller states who benefit from things like capital more end up getting a lot more bargaining power in these kinds of negotiations. For all these reasons, I'm very proud to stand in OO. Thank you for that speech, Leader of Opposition. May we now have the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, cool, can I check that I am audible, please? Yep. Three, two, one. I think the fundamental sleight of hand of Naomi's speech is who she does not say is already currently suffering. I think the states who are likely to go into these situations of economic warfare are states that do not have food, that cannot run their desalination plants, that cannot give their citizens water, that can't keep the gas on at night to keep their citizens warm, and cannot run the electricity to keep their citizens cool where their nights boil them alive. That is the slow death of the current legal system that locks people in places where harm is ultimately rendered upon them, where they have no recourse to other action. That is why it is necessarily legitimate to take up arms and why it is illegitimate for your state not to, and for the international law to keep countries in the bind that they currently do. We're going to do two things, or I'm going to do two things uh, in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to say why the outcomes, even if not, uh, why, why the outcomes aren't as bad as opening opposition likes to claim. And then secondly, why even if the outcomes are awful, why is still legitimate for you to take on this action? And in fact, why some states might have a moral obligation to do so. So let's talk about who is likely to take on this action. I think this is an action of last resort and a legitimization of last resort, but it is necessarily something that has to be proportional under the current frameworks of uh, uh, like international law. So you can't drop a bomb on a city and disrupt e uh, huge amounts of economic pressure unless that is something that is already happening to your current citizens, unless their factories are already shut, unless they are already starving on the streets. Therefore, it must necessarily be in a situation where there is a much larger state choking another the country's economic system off and out. We get a question from the closing opposition team who says, oh, but what about aid? Isn't it much better when you're just a victim suffering at the hands of a more powerful state? And we say no, because I think under modern legal systems, oftentimes capitalistic failure is framed as a failure of the state, as opposed to the direct actions of other people. When you say that it's legitimate to pick up arms, you say it's legitimate to react to the other harms that people are rendering upon you and make visible the actions that cause harm and otherwise create some kind Kind of sense of ownership or belonging to those people. I think you are far more likely to give aid to those whose pe whose famines you think are not responsible for them, but are responsible for the larger states who have exploited them systematically and who block them out of being able to leverage power later than you are if they are just accidentally starving and you think there might be corruption, you think there might be malfeasance. In terms of the next four points, which are broadly responses we get from the opening opposition team, Firstly, we get some idea that this war would never be proportional, but necessarily will spiral out of control. I think I already flagged up in my opening the ways in which physical harm is currently un, uh, going unseen and is unnecessarily being missed, which means that the proportionality comes from that initial action. In terms of later run on action, I think it is necessary that you listen back to Trinu's speech and you say, look, it is important that this is a rectification of power and who you bring to the balancing table. If you are a large state who's able to economically leverage control over a smaller state, that means you you already aren't going to going to a negotiation table because you have nothing to give up and nothing to lose. When harm is vested upon your citizens, you suddenly have people who are going to put pressure on you, who are going to say you have to go to this table because I don't think we're actually getting enough out of this, which means that the diplomacy action actually comes back to the table. You cannot cry uncle to the gods of capitalist war when necessarily think, think that's part of the system until you necessarily take up arms. That is the only way that you rectify this overall. In terms of 
actual status quo, and this is a new piece of material, so I think useful, is that I think lots of times our current gap in international law lets this happen overwhelmingly more often because we cannot ban things like sanctions because we think they are a necessary judicial tool, but we currently do not place any clamping on the extent to which we sanction team, uh, in sanction countries, right? And this is a good way of stopping that from happening because under a system of lawfare that currently operates where nations feel tons of amounts of money into huge law who can justify their every action, we necessarily give no recourse to smaller countries who would need this in order to say that they are fine, who then end up facing later cycles of harm from bigger countries who bully them into acquiescence. I think when you say that this is in some circumstances justified and give nations the capacity to say that their nations are justified, they can evade later harm from broader countries and therefore defend their citizens against harms that were previously suffocating them. Why is this necessarily justified? I think suffering in many cases whether you have a loss of capital is violence. And I think oftentimes this comes from a denigration of your borders, from the flow of goods, from your capacity to protect your citizens. And that ends up violating a core aspect of your social contract. I think under the social contract, you reduce people's capacity to inflict violence. And this happens in two ways. It happens both internally in your state and across to other states themselves. And that is because you it's like necessary to stop other harms from happening and states become the proxy or the kind of like ventriloquist of the large amount of people that they suffer so the moral intuition pump that's very sad that we get from naomi about torturing small children isn't actually correct unless that taught small child is actually a proxy for a nation of terrorists in which case it would be very justified to, to torture them because they have been set up as the behold the, the like holder of power therefore for these people and we think that it's still necessary to have states because states still have to mediate internal boundaries and still have to control their own citizens. States have to stop small villages from going across borders and pillaging, and therefore their infringement on the monopoly of violence of their citizens must be compensated by negotiations with other nations. And so far as other nations don't wish to negotiate with them, there it becomes necessary to not push that harm back on your citizens, but to create an equal and opposite reaction to states that stops that from happening, that says, look, we need you to be reasonable here. Let's take CO at this point. Yeah, so let's be very clear. Legitimacy and justification are not the same burden. Your best case proves why this is legitimate. Why is it justified? It is justified because it happens anyway, because nations with no other resources and no other resort are likely to have to take up arms. It is necessary to explain the legitimacy of it in case someone goes, but they could just starve in silence and death is not like a reasonable thing to do here. So I am explaining the of the legitimacy of this actions. So you can understand the moral basis of the law, given that I think it is relatively clear from the law itself how later benefits in the front of my speech would come about. Cool. Um, oh, I've lost my thoughts. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I think essentially what this ends up doing is this ends up rectifying the slow death that your citizens are likely to, uh, uh, to experience and ends up rebalancing an otherwise significantly lopsided ballot, uh, so lopsided law that brings people to the table, negotiate, uh, negotiates, etc. I think you might want to say that you have no obligation necessarily to trade with people. You might trade off of an act emission distinction. You might say, look, Emily, lots of nations in the world are incredibly currently poor. We don't think you have an obligation to give them money. And we don't think that makes it legitimate for you to turn around and harm them. We think you would only ever come to this situation when direct and obvious harms have, been come, have come to you. So things like sanctions, bans, boycotts, currency manipulation, things that entirely shut off your nation's capacity to work and starve them en masse. And that is the harm for which you are directly compensating against, proud to um, propose. Thank you for that fine speech. May we now have the DLO to close off the top half debate. I'm gonna start my speech in five seconds. Five, four, Three, two, one. Panel, I think it was extremely disingenuous for Emily to say that this debate is about, you know, small states fighting back against big states. Naomi told you why oppressors are overwhelmingly likely to be the ones to use this policy and to use this law in order to justify their actions. I'm going to add three layers of analysis here. The first is that the law is worded ambiguous. It's very ambiguous as to when sufficient economic harm has to be done to your state in order for it to be justified for you to react in a military manner. What this means is that big states with big lawyers and big influence, I'm finding it very easy for them to justify their actions, but they say, aha, look, I'm China, 
Vietnam has like kind of done some economic policies which I think are bad for me as China. So I'm going to use this international law thing to actually invade Vietnam. And this would be extremely bad for Vietnam. And this is the case of an oppressor using this law you have created in a bad way that you did not intend. Second of all, I just want to know oppressors have more military power, which means they're overwhelmingly more likely to be the ones to use this because they're the ones who can benefit most from this international law. But the third and most important one is that if you are an oppressed state, you know that if you try and fight back against economic policy with military arms, the other side that is economically oppressing you will now also fight back militarily. So you have gone from just being economically oppressed to being both economically and militarily oppressed. And because the other power that's oppressing you is the bigger power, they will definitely win on that military clash. This is why Vietnam will never have an incentive to be the first striker under this law, but China will. If Vietnam is the first striker, China is going to retaliate both economically and militarily. That's why the oppressed can never use this international law to the same degree that the oppressor can. So I think that is completely out of the round. What I think we're winning on in this round are two things. And I'll walk you through this one. The first set of things we're winning on is the idea that it is always principally wrong to react in this way. And the reason this matters is because to the extent that laws influence people's actions, then in most circumstances, if a law would be wrong in most circumstances, then we should not encourage that action by passing this law. And we think that it is always unjustified. So here are four or five observations for why this is always unjustified. The first thing to observe is that military retaliation is not a necessity. If anyone on the opening government or closing government wants to say there's a principle of self-defense, self-defense is only justified if it is a necessity. So for example, if Jason runs at me and tries to punch me, but I can just step out of the way, then I don't have a right to like punch him back. I just step out of the way, right? Because it is not a necessity for me to react in that way. So why is it not a necessity for you to use military force? Three reasons why. First, you have negotiation with the bargaining chips you have. I just want to note that if you're neighboring countries with each other, you rely on each other for trade, you rely on each other for peace, which means that often it is in each other's best interest to reach an economic deal or a peace deal or whatever, which means you always have bargaining chips that you're able to negotiate with as an alternative to military retaliation. Second of all, I noticed that some teams will probably want to run like the Israel-Palestine example, and, and obviously content warning here. And I just want to observe something. If we go back some years, in, when the peaceful Fatah controlled the Palestinian Authority in Palestine. That was the point at which Israel agreed to the Oslo Accords, which eventually led to the Palestinian Authority being given a degree of control over the Palestinian area. It was only when the more belligerent Hamas came to power that Israel started to crack down more. Conclusion of that is that even if you're like an extremely oppressed state, the ability to cooperate and negotiate can get you concessions from your oppressors. So that's the first thing you can negotiate. But the second thing is that you have economic retaliation yourself. So between China and the US, for example, they can economically retaliate against each other using like trade wars and stuff. So you can also economically retaliate as an alternative. The third alternative that you have to military retaliation is adaptation. So I want to be very clear with this, right? Even if someone commits a moral wrong against you, if you react back by like killing them, for example, then that is a moral wrong in and of itself. The act of killing is morally wrong, even if they had done something to wrong you first. That is why in many circumstances, even if they have committed a moral wrong against you, you can find ways to adapt to it in a way that allows you to live with it and not commit those moral wrongs as well. So that was the first observation I had. Self-defense requires necessity. They don't prove necessity in most cases. The second thing um, I want to observe on why this is unjustified is Naomi's point that retaliation is justified only if it reciprocally affects and addresses those who did the wrong to you. Naomi gave you a number of reasons. I just want to add one more, which is that the people who are harmed by any military conflict are not morally responsible for the economic policies being passed in the first place because they had no say in what the government did or they even voted against the government. But you know, even if you vote against the government, doesn't mean that you will win that vote. Or three, they were coerced into voting in a certain way, which means many of the people harmed did not cause you the harm in the first place. There is no reciprocity. The third observation I want to make on being justified is that retaliation is only justified if it's proportionate. Naomi gave you a number of reasons why it would be disproportionate because like war escalates, for example. The fourth observation I want to make on justification of this law is that any moral gain from this policy must be offset by any moral harm. There are massive moral harms when you lost of human life. And the reason why you should prioritize human life in, in this case is because when you do a military attack, that is a direct loss of human life. That is a direct moral harm. The comparative on their side is that the moral harm being done is like economic harms, which you can find ways to adapt to, right? By changing your economic lifestyle, for example, which means that because our harm is less adaptable, it is a greater moral harm and, and, and outweighs any moral benefit they get on their side. But last of all, deterrence is not justified. We know deterrence is not justified because if I am very scared of being invaded, so I like, bomb your country, 
we would say that that's not justified as a form of deterrence because A, is not proportionate, and B, it is itself a violation of human rights. The conclusion of all this is that it is always unjustified for people to react in this way. And now I want to take a QI from CG. CG, you say I'm torture. Uh, you say torture is unacceptable. Do you think that if you were being tortured, you would rather die or continue to live being tortured? I mean, I literally don't care because all of my analysis stands uh, see above. So, I mean, what is with playing with this? Just give me your extension. This is like not good form, guys. So anyway, I think the second thing to say here is very simple. Even if anyone on the opening government and closing government team can prove that this policy is justified, it doesn't matter. Because the question is whether we should pass this law. And that is the question of whether passing this law in practice will lead to good outcomes. And we think that in practice it will lead to bad outcomes. The first thing that Naomi told you here is that this leads to more wars overall. And that's obviously bad for the massive loss of human life, which like is a massive human right that you should care about or utility that you should care about. But there's another thing. As I flagged at the start of my speech, it allows oppressors to continue their oppression because they are the ones who can make best use of this policy to justify their actions and justify invading other people. And that's really bad because it causes greater oppression of the most oppressive society. So the last thing I want to do is talk about who polices international law, because this was the first POI given by CG. I suspect CG will say something about how international law is currently applied unevenly. The first thing to observe is that the laws being applied unevenly is worse on your side. See the analysis I gave earlier on like, you know, how oppressors are being able to take better advantage of this. But the second thing I want to observe here is that the law is much easier to enforce on outside of the house. The reason for this is because now there is a very clear line. Commit military reaction, retaliation, you are wrong, fuck off. But on their side of the house, people can always find ways to justify it using ambiguous language, as I flagged at the start of my speech, because the definition of economic harm is ambiguous. Lastly, game theoretic perspective, every country has an incentive to maintain this norm. This was proven in Naomi, so the fact that I'm at 7.15 shouldn't matter, I'm just flagging it to you. Thanks, guys. I would like to thank the DLO for that fine speech. That closes off the top half debate. We now have the member of GOV to kick off the lower half debate. Can I be heard? Yep. Um, cool. Sorry, let me just order lots of pieces of paper very quickly and then I am going to get going. Okay, this is actually in order. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Panel, there is no global policeman. There is no one going around and enforcing international law. The international community is not a world in which people follow normative laws about what they ought behave. It is a world of the powerful and the powerless, where the powerful take what they want and the powerless can do nothing about it. I think I want to make two observations about this debate before I give an extension. Actually, three. Neo, I gave you two POIs that flagged my extension well enough that you'd try to respond to it preemptively. I'm going to deal with the responses you give and then make the extension that you guessed anyway. Other two observations are as follows. To the degree that international law is not enforced by anyone at all and people regularly violate it, see US interventions all around the world. This is not a debate about outcomes because no one is going to follow this law. This is a purely normative debate about what, what, what we ought to expect from states and therefore the team who makes the correct normative statements is going to be the team that wins. Secondly, no narrative claims can accumulate from this lawmaking either, both because states expect that other states won't follow international law and because of the reality that those states do not follow international law means that you see the actions of others regularly violating this law and therefore can make no claims about what you expect other states to do based on outcomes that follow from the law, given that states act primarily by a self-interest because they want to stay elected by their electorate and therefore aren't really following international law where they don't think that they need to. To the degree that this is a normative debate, then I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to give the analytic justification for the principle of self-defense that is missing in OO, because the uh, OG rather, because the end outcome of top half is OG say economic harms are somewhat equivalent with physical violence. OO say that physical violence is never a justification for retaliatory warfare, and OG never respond to that. Secondly, I'm going to talk about who the primary obligations of states are to and why it is justified always for states to meet their primary obligations. Before that, though, I just want to go through and just deal with all the clutter OO put in our way about why you can't actually do these things, why they're illegitimate, take them out, and then there'll be lots of room for the positive principles. Uh, let's go through them in some order, maybe reverse order, I don't know. A, Neo says that it is not a necessity that you actually go to warfare uh, because you have other alternatives. Two things here. One, I question the intuition part. If Jason runs at me with the intent to cause violence, and I don't know if I can step aside, if I don't know if stepping aside is effective, but I know that punching Jason in the face will certainly stop him, I think I am justified in doing so. That is, it is not just that I 
I have the capacity to do something else that could be effective, but rather that I know that that thing will be effective. This is never filled by states who turn to violence, to military retaliation, because they know military retaliation will cost the lives of their own soldiers as well. It is something that they do as a last resort. Notice this observation also deals with everything else Neo says about the possibilities for alternatives, because the states who are engaging in this are the ones who have expended their alternatives, the ones for whom negotiations were too slow, for which the stranglehold on their country is killing their citizens so fast that negotiations, by the time they were effective, if they ever would be, would have done nothing. The second thing Neo says is that you are doing a greater harm by killing people. I have two observations here, one of which I flagged in the, uh, the POI. I don't think it is necessarily true that killing someone is a greater harm than making them live in complete economic deprivation. That is, if these people are starving every day, if they cannot eat, if they cannot fill their basic necessities, they live a life where they can't actualize themselves, where they live under a constant threat of pain, knowing that they can't do anything about it whilst they must suffer every day. There is a reason why people who are being tortured often choose suicide. It is because that torture is worse for them than death. I think that torture is the greater harm. Secondly, though, I just don't think these harms are comparable. I will deal with this on the proportionality thing later. The next thing we get from OO here is the claim that war is never justified since it instrumentalizes civilians. I want to note that the instrumentalization of some civilians is symmetric on either side of the house. The reason for this is action in and inaction are not inequivalent, they are in fact equivalent, because when a state chooses not to act, it is making the conscious choice to do so, and this in of itself is a choice and therefore an action. That means when a state makes a choice to not retaliate, it is making the choice to instrumentalize its own citizens at the cost of other citizens in another state, to the degree that some citizens in that other state consented to economic policy. If the thing you care about is being able to consent, you ought to side with government bench, because the fewest people consented to the situation that they are in, in the state that would retaliate. The final claim from OO here is the claim that this is not proportional. I think OG do deal with this well by saying why the economic harms are deep. I just want to note, though, retaliatory warfare rarely does that significant a damage. It is usually border localized and so on. No, I, I admit the damage is large, but proportionally it is less large than economic harms, which hit the entire country and every citizen within it, and they torture them. At that point, I think every OO claim that beats the principle of self-defense is out of the debate. Let's make the principle of self-defense. I don't think I need to justify why economic harms are equivalent to physical harms. I think that's done well in this debate already because states lose their access to services and their ability to provide services. This means, for example, they can't provide medical care. It means that people die. It means they can't provide food banks, etc. Why does a right to self-defense exist then? Two things here. One, I just want to give the intuition part. OO say that if a state hasn't attacked you, retaliatory warfare isn't justified. I would note, though, that we all intuitively believe that if a state invades my state, and I need to be able to take out their gun factories in order to stop them. I am justified in bombing those gun factories, even if civilians die. The reason for this, analytically speaking, is it is a basic part of your humanity to be able to actualize yourself to some extent within the world. That is to take the internal version of you and enact it upon others. What that means when physical violence strips that autonomy from you, when it removes who you are from the world and your ability to enact it, and it replaces it with a modicum of what it means to be human, a person who must starve every day, who can't do what they want and must live in continual discomfort but this is the largest principal harm that can happen to an individual because it strips them of everything it means to be human and replaces them with something lesser. Asking someone to live with that as an imposition upon their life, saying it is something that must be justified because if they act out in defense of themselves, what will happen is that someone else might be hurt is principally illegitimate. That means it is justified to act to defend yourself when these harms accrue to you, especially given that you have a primary obligation to defend yourself since you are the only one who can know what you need to be defended from and how you might do it. Uh, OG, I'll give you one last chance. Uh, OG, oh, oh. Self-defense is a reliant on the harm being done proportional. I can kill a robber in my home, but I cannot go on a murdering spree to try yeah. and find them. Why this is, is a nice in self-defense more important than like okay. millions of Yeah, please don't waste my time for the thing I literally rebutted you on earlier. I'm going to move on. Two, to whom do states owe primary obligations? I would posit that states owe primary obligations to their citizens and not to citizens of other states for broadly two reasons. One, that state is responsible for systematically stripping the right of those citizens to actualize their autonomy within the world. State power principle go pro, right? That is, what has happened here is that state has enforced laws upon the citizen without their consent and in fact prior to that consent and therefore removed their ability to do many things in the world. Critically in this debate, they have stripped their capacity to escape these harms. That is to say, these people cannot step aside from Jason running at them with murderous intent. They have have the capacity to leave because the economy has been ruined, meaning they often lack the capital to do so. Laws also make it difficult for them to leave that the state has put into place, and the state hasn't acted to defend them up until this point. To the degree, then, that the state has failed these people, and they are people the people to whom they owe the largest principal obligation, it cannot be unjustified for the state to meet this balance of obligations that is engendered upon it. 
This was purely a normative debate. Trapping someone in perpetual torture and saying they, they ought not be able to defend themselves is principally abhorrent. I don't care about consequences, CG. Thank you for that fine speech. May we now have the member of opposition to present the case for the closing off. Hey, could I check that I'm audible? Yep. And could I really quickly run to the bathroom before I start speaking? Of course. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, assuming I'm still audible. Oh, yep. I see a thumbs up. Uh, cool. Uh, just before I begin, just want to say this final stack. This is really fun. And I'm so glad I'm getting to be here with loads of debaters I admire. Thanks, Elle. Okay, uh, speech starting in three, two, one. Responses to the closing government self-defense principle. I want to note that the only mechanism that they provide as to why it is okay to torture other people to escape your own torture is the connection to the specific duty that a state possesses. I think the problem with this is that this justification is contingent on the state being a legitimate entity in and of itself. It is not necessarily clear to me why the arbitrary assignment of geographical location determined by the lottery of birth means that somebody from another state is legitimately allowed to be exposed to torture just so that somebody else is able to relieve their own torture. Given this, even if states have this duty, I don't think they have ever proven it has been legitimately accessed. And subsequently, I think the foundation for their self-defense principle is something that does not land. I'd also like to take this opportunity to respond to the opening government's social contract case. I don't fucking remember signing the social contract. Do any of you? The problem with that, therefore, is that this imaginary contract that you have with the state is not a sufficient threshold that has been met to literally expose other people to the loss of their lives and the loss of their dignity. Adding more chaos to trade off other chaos is not something that we should be able to stand over. Subsequently, I think that particular framing is gone. In terms of Elver responses in this debate, I think I want to make it very clear what the difference between justification and legitimacy is. It would be legitimate for me to have utilized my bodily autonomy to stay at a rave till 5 a.m. on Friday. However, it was not justified because my life became materially worse the next day and my expression of that right that I have is something that made my actual material condition worse. Given this, while it was legitimate for me to have done that, it is not something that was justified. And subsequently, I think in order to meet the threshold of an act being justified, I think specifically government's burden was to prove that the world would be a worse or better place as a consequence of this. But I am still going to engage in both clashes in this debate and explain why we win on both the principle and explain why we win on the practical clash in this debate. Cool. In terms of a principle clash, I want to note broadly two things in terms of weighing against opening opposition. Firstly, I think closing government's responses to them in terms of the symmetry of instrumentalization and view is broadly correct, and I think they are vulnerable to the response regarding reciprocity from opening government. The only material that opening opposition have left in terms of the principle justification is the ability to explore alternatives. I want to note that something as speculative as your ability to explore alternatives is likely not sufficient to justify a principle. And so far as maybe if I was running to punch Reese or Neil, they would have time to go and call the police. But the speculative impact of that means that you probably are not justified in doing so. And I think while opening opposition may be correct, I don't think it is enough to meet the threshold and you will ultimately adjudicate us winning this principle claim on the certainty that we are capable of providing. 
The certainty that we are going to provide in this debate in terms of why it has to be immediate threat that legitimizes this is ultimately that human life is the ultimate form of dignity. And so far as it is prior to all else and the way in which we interact with everything that we consider valuable experientially and all sorts of dignity and pleasure that we are able to access, the ability to preserve the maximal degree of human life ought to be the metric which you provide in this debate. Given this, I want to note two things as a consequence of this. Firstly, I think nobody in government bench has proven the trade-off as to why being tortured is worse than being dead, even in their best case, because there is always the ability for you to access other experiences if your torture eventually ends, or if your conception of your way of accessing pleasure changes. However, all of your ability to access future utility is deprived from you, and you ought to value our ability to access something rather than nothing. But secondarily, at the point at which you're trading off someone else's life, I think this requires certainty to justify the fact that you are going to put other people at risk. This is what legitimizes self-defense, because if somebody is running at me with a knife, I am going to die if I let them, so it is legitimate for me to respond. However, if they are running at me, and I don't know if they have a knife, it is not legitimate for me to kill them, because I may be killing somebody who is innocent. Specifically, you require that certainty in order to justify denying people access to any future utility, particularly given that one, at the point at which you are the first mover when you are retaliating in a military conflict, you are specifically utilizing a power asymmetry that you have on others and inflicting the greatest possible harm to them. We think that you ought to be cognizant of that. But secondarily, in terms of proportionality, because opening opposition never explain why that matters, I'm going to posit to you that in order to preserve the dignity of individuals, we ought to live in a society that is proportional so that we are able to have expectations of how we be treated. If I am walking across the street at a red light, I expect the car to stop, specifically because we have expectations of the way in which we are able to interact with society around us. This is why proportionality matters, because it breaks our worldview if something violates these expectations that we possess and leads to negative utility. Fourthly, in terms of collateral damage, I think it is probably just pretty bad for innocent people to die. I think opening opposition have done this, but we are going to be prior to it because we prove that wars get worse. In terms of Reese saying that outcomes don't matter, I think they probably do, because I think if it happens more, then by closing government saying that this is something that is torture, they themselves concede that we ought to value practical outcomes in this debate because we want to try and reduce the maximum amount of torture as possible. Given this, we think international law is broadly going to encourage more of it. Sorry, Emily, I fucked up timing. And as a consequence of this, we are going to go beyond opening opposition and explain why the sanctions that international law would instill upon you actually change behavior. Because what this does is it becomes a tipping point in your cost benefit analysis as to whether you would rather engage in war or whether you would rather explore the other outcomes like your ability to access aid. It's important to note the only people who can cripple economies are likely going to be large states because they're the ones who are able to block ports, gauge in price slashing, shit like that. Opening opposition say it's the other way around. Maybe they're true in some instances. We're probably more likely not a knife. Given this, at the point at which they are bigger than you economically, they are also bigger than you militarily, and as a consequence of this, a couple of things happen. Firstly, even if you access some degree of short-term instances, the re resistance, the retaliation that they have when they're defending their state is going to be way worse, and they can be more brutal because now they look like the good guys because you attacked them first. The comparative is that you are able to access aid when people care about your plight, and foreign actors are able to to go at actual things like sanctioning. Recognize that economic policy also constitutes sanctions and you are no longer able to sanction authoritarian regimes without getting fucking invaded, meaning that your mechanisms to fix this, both in terms of other economic warfare and ability to access aid are entirely exclusive. Given this, we think we have proven to you why this is something that is both morally abhorrent and going to result in better outcomes. Lucy, it's been a fucking blast. Good luck everyone. Thank you for that fine speech. Maybe now have the government to wrap up the case, CG. Okay, um, I'll take PYs in the chat and I will start in three, two, 
one. I think the right to self-defense is the most important thing in this debate, mainly because other teams don't explain it or don't understand what it actually is. I think Reese mechanizes what it looks like for a state that has a obligation to its citizens that it has been fundamentally oppressing to try to act even in absence of knowing certainty in those outcomes, because otherwise is depriving that actor and the other actors under the state of the last strain of agency that they have. If CEO wants to care about human dignity, they probably ought prioritize being able to have something, some degree of ability to retaliate when these kind of bad things are happening. Cool. What is the justification and why does it matter? And then I have, I think, three responses to what CEO uh, gave. Cool. Um, it is illegitimate to remove your uh, individual's ability to act when the most fundamental parts of your, their humanity have been stripped from them. I think this is, this is the important thing in this debate. When you recognize the characterization we've heard from all teams does concede that the way that the citizens that are being sanctioned are being harmed is intense to them, i.e. they've lost their ability to live, they've lost their ability to have means of survival. If you have this, if you, if you exist in this kind of awful position where you don't have options for your survival, you should be able to act to some degree to take some of that agency back. Taking away this choice and saying in international law, we're not going to normalize this kind of thing is removing the last strain of autonomy that all teams seem to care about if they are prioritizing those kind of things. What does Jason say? Jason says human life is inherent to dignity, therefore you should not take it away. I think this is just not true. And this is why the torture intuition pump that Reese tells you works. When people are being stripped of the dignity that they get through their agency, i.e. when they're living, they do not choose to continue living life because they know they're being harmed in a way that is far more important comparative to what is just going on, like the goodness that life can bring. The second thing that I want to say is that rights just fundamentally are not things that can be treated, i.e. If, if someone is going to die, then, uh, then I don't know why they should like be able to say, well, I don't want someone else to die, so I'm just going to be fine with that kind of outcome. I think there is a violation of a violation of your individual rights are wrong, then you have a right to defend yourself. It does not matter if that trades off with someone else's rights insofar as yours have been infringed on. There's no obligation you have externally to that kind of degree because you had an inherent right to act that way from the beginning insofar as you've been deprived from your agency from the start. The third thing is that certainty is not the important thing in this debate, it's proportionality. The explanation for, um, yeah, I think the, the explanation for this is like if someone threatens you with a gun and you don't know it's a novelty toy, you are still justified in acting as though your life is being threatened, even if you're not entirely certain of what the situation is going to be, because it looks like you being in a situation where you have been deprived of your ability to like have any meaningful autonomy, which means you should be able to respond in a proportionate way, even if it means harming someone else or like killing the person that is threatening you. I think this could be true from any threat insofar as we never have certainty in any of our actions, but we still should act because what we do know is that we have an obligation to ourselves and to protect our rights. This I think is symmetric to the state it, when the state like should prioritize the lives of its citizens and also its own autonomy is being infringed on, it ought be able to act externally because it does know that those kind of harms are uh, existent. Cool. I'm going to move into like weighing over op bench as a whole. Oh, cool. Opening opposition wants to say that killing people is wrong from an a priori perspective. I think this may just be because I'm technically a novice until two weeks from now. I'm just unclear why there is a difference between the harms happening to these economic means they're talking about on their side and these ones. The external actor, the one that is sanctioning this uh, country supposedly, is one, actively choosing to cause harm to the civilians there, killing people, and secondly, instrumentalizing citizens for their own agenda. This is, I think, the important thing that happens in the normative claim here. Because if it were true that international law exists fundamentally to say, no, you should not be instrumentalizing other individuals, it would probably it would probably also say you should not be able to sanction people to the degree that economic harm can cause these kind of failures. I think um, sanctions that do kill people would not be allowed. What these things actually do, though, is give us kind of norms to say that you should be able to advocate yourself to some degree, and that's the importance of what Reese tells you. If OO agrees that instrumentalization of individuals is bad, they must recognize that the state experiencing the economic harms in choosing not to act is then instrumentalizing its citizens because of that unknowingness that's also being talked about on CO. I think the illustration that Reese gives of the harms that people have in these in these places is really important because um, if they are need to act to mitigate conflict, I think that's always going to be better because what's happening otherwise is the state is choosing not to act, therefore allowing its own citizens to suffer in that kind of way when it could have chosen action otherwise. The state is always going to be complicit in this harms when it allows them to continue without doing anything, which is why it ought at least try because the citizens cannot opt out of the state being harmed and they have a reciprocal obligation to them, ought to do, them, do something in the same kind of way this functions on an individual um, way. Insofar as the state owes these individuals something in turn because state power principle, I'm using that that's analysis now, by the way, but I guess it works. I think it should try to some extent to actually make these kind of things happen. Um, yeah, because not doing something is choosing to allow the citizens that live under the state to be subjected to these harms. I don't think escalation, as they're talking about in CO fundamentally matters, if there's harm being done, attempts ought be made to counter it when it is stripping people of their rights. I think doing nothing in these situations support. Another silly thing that you can say, if you're watching a baby drown, you should probably try to do something because there is certainty and that's harm happening. And you have the capacity, insofar as you have an obligation to that other life to protect it, you should probably do that, even if it means someone else could be harmed 
informed because what it looks like is being able to like actually advocate for these kind of things. Cool. I think someone like threatening you with a gun could still punch you if you remove the gun through them by like depriving them of their autonomy, but you should still act because the threat there is loss of your life, loss of your autonomy, which is why these things are principally justified. And I think all of this functions a priori to anything else we've heard in Mott Bench or from our OG. Um, but before I talk about OG, I'll take a PY from uh, OO. Any moral good must be weighed against moral harms. We provided the weighing in terms of A, instrumentalization, B, the ability to adapt to direct versus indirect harm, and C, the total number of people affected. On that weighing, all moral harm outweighs your moral good, so this is unjustified. Okay, cool. I think all that exists in absence of the actual actors we're discussing, though, because all the same kind of moral harms that you agree are harms are being done to people on your side as well, i.e. the state is being infringed on, the civilians that live in the state are being infringed on. If you think that they should just do nothing in those kind of instances, that's probably something that we should have heard weighed out. We did not hear that, which means anything they want to say about how there could potentially be some degree of escalation does not matter, because the right to the, uh, the ability to like preempt that and to try to make sure that your autonomy is not going to be infringed on into the future comes before any of that kind of analysis. Cool. Open government, I think, is, uh, we're probably going to weigh over them for a few reasons. I think they say the word self-defense, but never justify why this is a principle you ought to care about. That only happens in Reese's speech and the excellent intuition pups work there. I think they hint their principle on getting some degree of economic outcomes or better outcomes for these states, which just means it's going to fail. I think the social contract, as Jason talks about, could be a thing, but the actual, uh, I think the actual principle reason that we care about this is that insofar as the state is oppressing its citizens and Reese gives you that, it ought to try to like make sure that their rights are going to be protected into this, into the future. All this is to say that I think the main points that they want to give you, the only things that are standing so far as their practical could or could not be true, is that there is some degree to which you should be able to protect yourself if you are in a situation where you know there is a massive amount of harm. That mechanization and that explanation only comes out in CG. That's why the principle of self-defense is actually justified. It's not just something that could be good or could be bad. I think they say the state should push violence back out because this is the best case scenario. I think Reese is a prerequisite for all of this, meaning when we tell you that states, insofar as they know that there is a harm being done to their civilians and they have the ability to act to protect those kind of things, not doing that is a moral failure on their part. It also means there's likely just to be more harm into the future. That is a certainty. If CEO wants to talk about certainty, that harm will continue. You ought to at least try to do something about it because you know that your rights are something that should be valued for all these reasons. Um, very proud to propose. Thank you for that speech. And now to close off this debate, may we have the optic. Um, am I audible? Yeah. Cool. Um, just, okay, my internet was fine for the entire competition, bar like two minutes before this final, um, which is great. Uh, so if I do manage to cut out or whatever, can someone just type it in the chat? And I will see that because I seem to be able to follow everything. But if I cut out, well, let me know. Um, OG, get a POI ready. I'll take you at some point. Okay. Look, I know we're debaters, but like genuinely, the state isn't a person. and Jason running at you whilst a very funny analysis isn't actually in any way similar to what this looks like. Because in reality, what this looks like is about a thousand Jasons running at a thousand different civilians. And what I mean by that is there are for, for economic policy or economic warfare as it's characterized in this debate to actually have the impact that opening government and then closing government want to talk about. It's multiple different acts happening to multiple different people in multiple different ways, different shipments, different issues being changed and, and food not getting to people for different reasons and in different methods. Why then is it not equal, equally analogous to say that the state is like a person enacting self-defense, i.e. I don't know who it started with, Neo with Jason running at them. Why so? Because putting yourself, uh, choosing to, a state cannot determine what is the best outcome for all of those people in all of those situations, i.e. it cannot under, it cannot utilize their individual uh, like conception of a good life in order to achieve an aim that it may or may not achieve. And what do I mean by that? Because uh, CG are quite good when they say, look, uh, the, the loss of agency is really bad and that's why we don't like torture and that's why we don't like uh, starvation because you lose an agency, you lose agency. At the point where a state decides to co-opt the thousand Jasons that have been, uh, have been run at, they are no longer acting on behalf of those people's, those people's agency because they don't have control 
over what happened to them in the same way that those people never had control over what happened to them in terms of that those economic impacts. What does that mean? It means now the state is no longer justified in doing or never justified in doing these actions at the point where it now reduces their their citizens agency twofold right so there's there's the citizens that have their agency removed both economically but now because their state is involved in military warfare right because this becomes really interesting when cgs say look the reason it is okay to fight out is because torture is really bad and starvation is akin to torture it is asserted by closing government that people kill themselves rather than dealing with torture. Like genuine intuition pump. There are lots of people who have gone through the military who live happy lives after being tortured. John McCain being a very public one who spoke about his time being tortured and then he went on to live a full life and did not kill himself. Please don't take an assertion and an intuition pump, even as the whip conceded in closing government. An intuition pump is not analysis, especially when not shown that it is analogous with the rest of this debate. I think then, uh, the uh, thing that Jason said that's really important is the difference between legitimacy and justification, right? Because I think you can say, look, if you're starving, it can be legitimate uh, to steal a, a loaf of bread, right? But it therefore does not expand to say that it is legitimate to steal the bread out of another man's hand and make them die and make them harmed. And that's where, again, this coming back to the torture example that CG wants to bring in, torture is not just the, the pursuit of escaping torture does not justify replacing somebody else in your position of torture or having a person sit with you and also be tortured. Why is that so true? If closing government like agency so much and like self-defense so much, they think that those rights have to equally apply to other people as well. There is no justification in closing government as to why the, 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 the person pursuit of non-torture of one individual justifies the torture of another individual. Equally, those lives are equally as justified, are equally as capable. Again, we come back to it's understandable. It might be inevitable. It might be something that you can empathize with, but never meets the burden of justified. Open government, go. Yeah, the state is the only proxy through which these people are able to act. You gain economic, you gain from the economic destruction of a nation, therefore it's equally legitimate that, that nation is able to harm you in return. Why should a million face a slow death when you could harm a hundred and get them to the negotiation table? You said legitimate again, but I'm going to say you assume justified. I think a couple of things on that. First of all, the state being an aggregation of those people does not necessarily take into account that they are the moral arbiter of all those people's desires, needs and feelings, right? Many of those people might be perfectly happy to live a life of yes, hunger and yes, pain, but like living with their family, seeing their family every day and yes, eating some forms of scrap. To say that nobody who has lived in poverty or warfare, or sorry, not warfare, economic warfare has not lived a happy life reduces the majority of the world to uh, the majority of the world in history to not have having happiness within their life and I think that is something that is a very bold claim and yes it might be an intuition from to a lot of us who like to prioritize having all of our needs met but it does not justify the removal the possible removal of all of those persons accesses to agency and happiness why is that then important in terms of what Jason told you I think Jason is the only person in this team in, in this debate to explain to you that justification is is also therefore reliant on the plausible outcomes and the, the uh, I suppose, duty to not remove other forms of help from your citizens. He explains to you that at the point where you engage in this warfare, you remove your avenue to gain aid internationally. You remove your avenue, your avenue to find uh, support from other ventures in, insofar as feeding your population and reducing um, and reducing that torture that you talked about in the first place. Why is that so true? At the point where you are engaging in warfare, you are no longer someone that it is easy to offer aid to. Why is that true? I think at the point, the reason we we very, we very often don't give aid to people involved in war, one is just a, a kind of uh, a wish to not get involved in that warfare yourself because you don't want to be involved with the idea that sanctioning equals boots on the ground and the, and the possible loss of agency and life to your own people. But secondarily, the reason and the more principled level is we don't give aid to people in, uh, involved in unclear wars uh, that, that, that are not justified because it is a judgment call we don't believe ought to be made unless there is a clear target, a clear and immediate uh, uh, harm um, to those people's 
uh, to that state's lives or to those people's lives, i.e. the only justification for war is one in which the harm is immediate, i.e. when boots are already on the ground in your country and you are defending yourself, or if you are putting boots on the ground in another country to defend the innocent lives that are, are guaranteed uh, pain there. The, the difference there of us between our opening and indeed both uh, government teams is the immediacy and the proven likelihood of our justification claim. What does that mean? Our, we are saying war is only ever justified at the point where you can immediately prove that you going to war is not is 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 in is de facto saving at least some lives that would have otherwise been lost. I think in this uh, in this debate and this justification that cannot be applied because you cannot prove you will save those lives. You cannot prove that going to war will pr improve the lives of your people, and you cannot prove the legitimacy of it or the justification of it. Thanks. It's been lovely. Thank you for that speech and thank you for that fantastic debate. I genuinely had a very fun time judging it. Um, yep, I think maybe the outcome can turn off the recording.